The business analytics program is a mixture of academia and, and business. So that means that we have professors and instructors both from academia as well as, as business. We have business industry partners, big banks, startups, technology firms, data science outlets who work with us both to develop the curriculum. We want to make sure that our students know what is needed in the business, what is needed in real life. So it, this is not a purely academic program. We want to make sure that our students can do very well in the job market. Today, there are many jobs and many professions where data has become abundant and where people want to learn from data to make better decisions. We're very much focusing on both quantitative skills but also uh, leadership skills and, and, and uh, business experience. So we can actually mix people with business experience and people with quantitative skills in the classroom so that they can learn from one another. Okay, let's start. Welcome, everyone. I promise the organizers if there's a hat from yesterday Christmas event, then I'll wear it. And so here's me wearing it. And, uh, and so welcome, everyone, to a fantastic event that we are uh, doing here at uh, CU. It's going to be a discussion and debate about Stata versus R versus Python. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Okay, if not, then please, you know, let, let me know. You can you can write in the chat box if there is someone listening to it. And uh, so first, I'd like to welcome all of you both here uh, at CU. Of course, you know where you are, but those uh, hopefully watching online, welcome to Vienna and welcome to uh, CU. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out how this works. Also, welcome to the um, <coughs> Department of Economics and Business. We are hosting and sponsoring this um, organization. And um, as you may see on the slide, actually we have a bunch of programs. Um, all of them are pretty data heavy. So we have a PhD program in economics and business administration. We have an MA program in economics and economic policy. And we run two MS programs in business analytics and finance. Some of the students are here. Uh, you can also find them uh, online if you want to talk about uh, their experience. So it turns out that I looked up our course offerings. Um, and we do have a variety of courses here at CU. And as you can see, we are using a variety of software, data, or Python. Um, you know, we have classical econometrics, coding for economists. Um, there is prediction, machine learning, NLP, big data, computing, data visualization, and many other things and I will take this off because it's pretty hot and you already see me stupid so you know it's kind of uh, kind of okay um, and so you can see already that, that here at the department you know we do all of these languages and actually actually more and, and maybe Mark will tell about his pet project uh, language and, and others are, are using other languages uh, as well one more thing I wanted to Flag, and that's also segue to introducing myself, which I forget. So my name is Gabor Bekesh. I work here at the CU uh, Department of Economics and, and Business. I'm going to be the master of ceremony today. Um, and um, one thing I wanted to, to mention is that if you are interested to learn to code, some of you are obviously proficient here. Some of you are figuring out which one to learn. That's part of the, the reason you're doing this debate, to help you figure out which language to choose. So we, the department, uh, uh, finance developing free online courses, both in R, R, Stata, and, and Python. You can see actually these are the same code snippets. They're pretty small. And there's a typo here that I was pointed out earlier. But you can see exactly the same code run in different uh, languages. So actually, you can, so uh, if you're interested, you can, you can, you can check it out uh, later. OK, so as I prepare to do my intro, I thought, okay, let's, you know, if you are not very much into coding, how does coding explained uh, by the economist? So that, that should be fine. Um, and basically, it's about instruction to computers, right? So our, our fantastic debate teams will talk about how their favorite language talks to the computer, how it bridges the gap between humans and, 
and, and computers. <clears throat> and of course, again, if you are here, maybe you're not really asking yourself why coding, but if you're just starting out, it may be useful to think about that the reason we kind of push both here in the department, but also most of us in their, their research, uh, push coding a lot because um, it's gonna help us to, to create reproducible work. Right? That's the essence that you may do you know, loading your data or filtering observations, running regressions, or doing text mining, it's very useful if you can actually reproduce what you have done, share with others, um, and then, you know, the, the, the codes I shared with you come from um, a textbook that, that I co-wrote earlier, and the reason those codes exist in different languages so that everyone can reproduce the case studies that are, that are in the book. But it's also the same if you're doing a term project or if you're doing research, you want to have something um, that people can see and, and, and share. And you know, when I say coding language, I'm going to use it pretty broadly. Right? Anything beyond Excel is a coding language. Excel is not a coding language, although VBA is, but, but anything above a spreadsheet is, is a coding uh, language. So we're using it at Libre. OK, so Python is going to be uh, actually the third team today. It's, uh, I copied it from Wikipedia and, and Python's own Manuals. So Python is a programming language that lets you work quickly and integrate systems more efficiently. It's a high-level, general-purpose programming language. Right? It's open source, and again, if you are going to learn about this, you can, you can check, uh, check the link uh, below. The, the slideshow will be shared, so you, know, you don't have to. So when Python came out, it was 1991, I stole this idea from Miklos. The leading song at that time was gonna make you sweat by CNC Music Factory. And I thought I would play a clip for you, but then I realized copyright, so I, I'm not gonna do that, but if you're interested, you can do it on your own. R is a programming language for statistical computing and graphics, is what they say, say about themselves. R is created by statisticians for statisticians, specifically for working with data. It's another open source when Stata came out, the leading song was UB40, I Can't Help Falling in Love. It's a very good song. Again, I wanted to play it, but copyright. So you have to, older, older versions of you will play it in their heads, and then younger people will just look it up. Like, what are these old people talking about? Anyway. Stata is a complete integrated software package that provides all your data science needs data manipulation, visualization, statistics, and automated reporting. It's created and maintained by Stata. When Stata came out, the leading song was Careless Whisper by George Michael. <coughs> Again, look it up or... <laughs> but I love this picture, no? I mean, it's um, so the plan for today as we're going to have a debate, there will be three teams. Right? Each team is composed of a faculty and an alumni, and I'll, you know, we're going to introduce them uh, to you. Um, and then we're going to have a round table where we debate stuff, and then there will be a lot of questions and answers, both people from here and then uh, from online. Now, how we do that? There is an app called Slido, which you can see the QR code on your paper, or you can try to catch it with your phone. If you are watching it online, again, I think this, just taking your phone to, to this to the screen works, or at least it worked for me, but also you can see it on, on the chat. And then you can see already a question, which please answer. It's a super complicated question. It's basically asking if you're here or not. I mean, if you are here in Vienna or you are watching online, that's gonna help us to see Local people are leading, but online people, please do it. You're catching up. It's very exciting. Now you're uh, catching up. I mean, by the numbers, you should win. So please, please try and vote. <coughs> Do 
you, you may carry on voting, but in the same time, I'm going to start the second poll. Can you see a second poll? It's the same. It's the same link. You don't have to do it again. It's the same QR code. So this is a this is a, the first question that asks you which coding language should a student first master for data analysis. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to do what, what is called an Oxford type debate. So I'm asking the same question now. Please answer it. And then we have the debate. And then I'm going to ask it again. Right? And then whoever, whichever teams gets the largest positive difference in their support wins. Okay, so please, please vote. Okay, so also some of you, while you're voting, uh, some of you may have seen that I also ran a survey. And the survey was uh, mostly pushed on, uh, on our Twitter and Mastodon account. Mastodon, if you haven't come across, is a German social media website uh, or, or social media site or something that is uh, kind of uh, bringing in people who are leaving Twitter for whatever reason uh, they want to. So this is, this is how it was organized. It was framed uh, recent, so, recent social science graduates. Um, please give some feedback about your, you know, your experience in, in, in learning. Right, there's around more than 340 responses uh, this, until this morning. So um, you can see on this map that uh, people who filled in came from actually graduated, right? So because we asked which university they graduated, and then Google is smart enough to match university names to geolocation and then create this brand. Um, you can see obviously most people who filled in the, the survey will come from Europe and, and the United States, but there's also South America, Africa, Asia, and, and quite a few people from, from uh, Australia as well. Again, in terms of where they read it, right? So that's the that's the survey. I'm going to tell you some background of what people are doing, right? And then we can that that's that's going to be our benchmark for for the year. So people do data analysis. Ninety-one percent said that in their jobs uh, they do some kind of data analysis. So if you are kind of learning. Uh, econometrics, data analytics, statistics, it's, 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 it's something that people do. Of course, the more precise statement is people who filled in this survey on coding, right? whether I ex explicitly asked, did you code, or what was your experience? Of course, they do data analysis, right? because this is why they came to, came to this. So in terms of people filling in, um, almost all of them had a graduate degree, and uh, less than two-thirds of them were master's students or had a, a master's as their highest degree, a uh, bit more than a third have, have PhD. And so they said that when they went to school in their last graduate program, right, actually 41% had a lot of courses. And then um, another 40% had a few and 60% and had none. Right, so when you think about how many courses do you have, Right, you can benchmark to this is this is the people who are again filling in these surveys and, and working on, on data time. So so actually quite a few people have quite a few courses. Um, so most people will study some kind of coding, right? And 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 people could fill in more, so it's not gonna add up to hundred. And based on this, say that R is the most Viably taught courses. Python is third, but actually other languages such as Julie and MATLAB are also taught. Right? Even in this department, I love that, that that one of my colleagues teaches macroeconomics in Julia. Then we have a course with eViews, we have a course with MATLAB. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know the others. 
maybe. Okay, I asked actually earlier on Twitter, they asked a very similar question, but I asked instructors. Right? I asked the other side, so, you know, again, fellow instructors in, in, in social science masters and in other programs, what are you teaching? And again, you could see that state on R are kind of equal, and then Python is, is third, and actually very few people who fill this in said something else, although the choice because of Twitter's number of letters was more limited. Right, but that, that's pretty similar. Actually, it's a very large sample. It's a very large sample. Um, and then we ask, okay, so this is your background, right? What is, you know, what is the language you are more uh, proficient in? And then, then again, you can see kind of a balance between um, Stata, R, and then Python coming close. And I'm kind of giving also these numbers and these, you know, if you hate pie charts, then you can write an email to Google. Uh, or, or if you don't like this, I've tried to change the colors. Um, again, I couldn't figure it out, so you can, if you're not happy with this, then just write to Google. Um, but not, not me. Um, and then actually, again, you can see a little bit of people doing something else, but clearly these three languages are the most, uh, most frequent that, that we ask. And then I asked, okay, so in your job, Right, in your job up to the past two years, which languages have you used? And then you can see a more balanced situation between state R and Python. Again, you could take more than one, right, so they don't add up to one. Actually, more than 20% of people would use one of the other languages as well. Very few people who filled in the survey about coding do not use any. And then finally, I said, okay, should we have this debate, right? So, so uh, unless you were only focusing on the World Cup, which is the best way to, to spend the weekend, um, and you kind of come across what's going on in the world, OpenAI, which is a for-profit company, uh, produced um, a chat <coughs> algorithm, which seems to be taking over the internet. And I asked, the, you know, asked our Lord Master, Algorithm, should we have this debate? Right? So, are Python or Stata, which language shall I learn to master data analysis? I also told them to, to be brief. Um, and then, you know, the reply from the, from the machine is that all three languages are popular choices and it depends on your specific needs. They are widely used. Stata is commercial, others are open, they are versatile. Stuff that will come up in the debate, right? So, but I wanted to make sure that it makes sense to have this debate. Because if it's already decided, then why bother? So uh, this event is recorded, and there will be a, um, a video version of this, I think, in about a week. Right? So you can, you can, um, you can re-watch it if you want. I'm not sure why you would, but, but you can't do that and you can share it with your friends and colleagues and, and anyone you want to. So that's it on, on, my, on my side. I will want to start the debate. And as I said, I want the feasty debate, right? So I asked the debate teams in the first um, round to be partisan and then we try to be, you know, more, more civil. Thank you. Okay, so... Uh, Thanks, that that's, was the introduction, and let's start a debate. So I ask the debate team to come and please take your seats. Okay, so before we start, there are, there are mics you can, you can use. So before we start, I, I ask all the debate team to say a few words about themselves, and then we're going to start eight-minute uh, presentation by the teams, and then the, the round table. So um, maybe we can start from here. Hello, I'm, I'm Miklos Koran. I'm a professor of economics here at CU. And I'm also uh, serving as the data editor of the Review of Economic Studies, which is the leading journal in economics. And, and in that second role, uh, I 
I read a lot of work written by economists, and I make it my mission to uh, help economists write very cool. And so that's how I end up here in this debate. Hi, I am Martin Fleck. I'm working at RBB Economics Consultancy in the Netherlands. Uh, also, I'm a PhD candidate in economics here at CU. And I have experience with all these three languages, but I'm representing Team Seda today because I'm convinced that's the best for both. <laughs> <laughs> Not meeting to the response. Uh, I'm Mark Alfred. I'm also an assistant professor. I mean, I'm also a professor here in the department uh, in economics. I teach an introduction to our course, so I also will defend data because it's the best. <laughs> no, I'm not really. I'm not really. Um, I mostly, actually, most of my coding is not data analysis, so it's actually uh, on an application for experiments. I run online experiments, so we can talk about that later. But I do uh, data analysis, so I don't always do data analysis, but when I do, it is enough. So. Hi, my name is Zsuzsa Holder. Uh, I'm a data scientist at an IT company called MRSYS. I work in Budapest. And I was a CEO graduate. I graduated uh, in economics, master in economics, like 10 years ago or something like that, so a long time ago. And uh, throughout my uh, work experience, I actually worked both with Theta, R, and Python. Uh, so I think I have a good knowledge of, of this. And I'm going to. Uh, uh, be in the R team today, so go on. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Arida Mucho. I'm also an assistant professor of economics in the department. I teach a bunch of courses Python related, and for my research, I use both Python and Stata. I'll be defending Python today. I'm a strong believer of <laughs> Hi, all. I'm Diana. Uh, I also actually studied at CU and graduated in 2020 from MA in economics. Currently, I work as a data scientist in BlackRock. If you know what BlackRock is or if you don't, it's the biggest asset management company in the world. And uh, given that I'm a data scientist and I work with a lot of programs to data science, I know which one is the best. So I think, <laughs> I think you should all trust me. And as you can see, I'm in team Python and there's a reason for that and you'll know. Okay. Fantastic. So you see how I picked my fantastic debate team, right? One was that have a faculty and an alumni, so you can talk to them if you're interested in programs and experience and stuff like that, but also that they are into a feisty deep debate, which we should start now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The team data is going to convince you that data is the best tool to start data analysis. Okay, so that's the uh, job we have in front of us. So think about what we are comparing when we're comparing programming languages or these three objects, data, Python, and R. And I think Garbor has, has touched upon this a little bit in the introduction. On the one hand, we're comparing programming languages. On the other hand, we're comparing the software application that is running on your computer. And whenever we're asking, what is the best tool to start data? So what's the best software application as a, for a beginner? And we also have a few words to say about the quality of documentation for, uh, for a tool and the community uh, using, using that tool. So I think the... Um, the programming language, I think, is the most important aspect, aspect of this. And we'll actually uh, come back to some code examples. I think we saw a definition of what code is, but primarily, you know, code should be working for humans because we are the ones working with code. Uh, every computer code that we write is going to be read by a lot of people, hopefully. And, and it's very important that they understand that. And we'll show that, that in this, uh, so kind of the programming language itself, data clearly wins out. Uh, I have the other other two options here. I have to say that in order in order four dimensions, data is winning, but this is the number one reason why you should work data. And uh, unlike the competitors, if you have data on your computer without installing anything else, it's going to work right away. So anything you want to do in a particular data application, it's going to work out of the box, and that is actually a very very important. Uh, you know, your boss asks you to do something and get it done in 30 minutes. You don't want to start downloading 
packages and pumping with um, with, with other libraries you want to get them chopped up. And so we'll illustrate how that how it works in a little bit. So this is the uh, software application for data. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to go into the interface, but it's a nice uh, and very functional uh, user interface. And we'll see uh, some code example later. So also as a beginner, uh, getting started with your data and analytics journey, it's a great way, great way to start. Now, one thing I really, really like about data is the uh, documentation. So very, very high quality documentation. So whenever you're doing statistical work, there's some underlying mathematics, and most often you don't care what sometimes you do, and all the math is in there. Um, you're not going to read it most of the time, but if you need it, it's there. So, uh, you know, we have heard horror stories when people coding up something in, in some open source language and it's leaving the wrong result. Here you can be certain what's happening in your in your code. And then uh, lastly, coming to the community. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm the data editor of the review of economic studies. So there I see a lot of, so these are, my job is there to review the replication packages that are submitted by the authors. So if you're uh, publishing an article, then you have this company code and data, and we have to make sure that it works and that you know, other people can use your code and data. And so if you look at what uh, software uh, people in the economics uh, academic community are using. Again, they might be using multiple. Stata is clearly the winner there. About 80% of, of articles are using Stata, and they might be using other uh, other languages as well. But very, very uh, definitely winner is Stata. And it's very important to have kind of a community of experts with whom, with whom you can talk. And then, uh, as, as Martin will, will talk about it, it's also widely used in the private in the private sector. Uh, some examples from recent uh, job advertisements in um, in consultancy companies requiring you to speak Stata uh, in order to apply apply for the job. So let me uh, pass it over to Martin. Thank you. I would like to show you an application of, of an analysis that you are doing on a daily basis, both in academia and industry. So. In this very simple exercise, we are using a data set to produce regression output and a simple descriptive graph, which you can later include in your paper on your, or your report. I am sure that others, other teams will try to impress you with some fancy analysis, but believe me, those are much rarely used than these simple descriptive statistics and regressions. And to do that, do that this data, you just uh, use the data without any libraries, without any packages, uh, combine them, uh, do some data manipulations using uh, syntax, which is understandable, using just plain English, uh, run the regression, and you in, in just four human readable lines, you end up having the regression output. Um, <clears throat> The same same goes for uh, visual visualization. Suppose you are interested in uh, the quality to price ratio across across countries in uh, five star hotels. Again, simple simple human human readable syntax, uh, aggregating the data, uh, assigning some labels, and with a very short line without any uh, options or parameters, you just end up having a fairly reasonable, nice looking graph. Um, now, how would they look like in other languages? Um, so in, in R, this would be much more complicated to produce a graph like this. And uh, that's the case with, with Python as, uh, as well. So for a, for a data manipulation, uh, the, the syntax is much less human readable and uh, much less easy to memorize for a beginner, which is relevant for someone looking for a first language. Now, we, we, we also uh, ha had a look at this open AI and ask, uh, asked chat GPT to, to translate our uh, sh very short eight line script to both Python and R. And, uh, 
<laughs> so our very simple human readable plain English eight line code, which, which produces two widely used output would look like this in Python. And also would look like this in our, this is not that nice, I guess. Thank you very much. Okay. We move on to the next. Uh, so one thing I wanted to mention while they're starting up is that we are running a Q&A on Slido. So the same application you could vote, but right? you can ask questions and you can also vote on questions. Right, so you can, uh, you know, figure out which one is the most interesting question, and I'm going to ask them later on. Oh, okay, you start. Okay, so thank you very much. So welcome. Our slogan today is rated R. We are Mark Kaufman and. So um, R is the language for the mature data analysts. <laughs> so I teach an introduction to uh, R course where I use the tidyverse, I teach it. It's a very user-friendly entry point for R. You might hear some people complain that R syntax is difficult and so on. People don't like it. But you know, those are anecdotes. So let's get some data. Let me make this bigger so that you see better. This is a survey of developers done by Stack Overflow of how much people liked it and loved versus dreaded. Tidyverse comes in second. That doesn't sound very hated to me. Now you will also see pandas, which is a, a copy of Tidyverse in Python, coming down here somewhere, I'm not gonna count. And then you will also notice that Stata isn't there. It's not because I was mean and cut it off. It was a developer survey. Stata is not a programming language. This is, it's a GUI. So that's why it wasn't included in this survey. So as a slogan to, for you to remember what this is about, R, the language for the mature data analysts. Python has this Zen of Python. There's one and only one way to do things. In this case, copy R. And Pandas copying R, as the Python com uh, programmers will tell you, it's a shallow copy. It's not a real copy. And finally, then we have Stata, the GUI for Goofy. OK, but with that, let us move on to some actual code and handing over to Zhuzha. So I'm going to present you some more data supporting your argument. And what's a better way to present your data than preparing some uh, nice and interactive uh, data visualizations? So I'm just going to quickly open this up. And you see that what we did is that we prepared a web application showing, showing very interesting information uh, regarding the debate. And uh, this application today serves multiple purposes. First, it demonstrates that it is relatively easy. Uh, actually, in this case, it's very easy to put together a web application uh, using only R. So this particular one took only 40 lines of R code, and it took only one additional line of code to deploy it to this publicly available website, which you can check out later. The other purpose it serves is that I can actually show you the data. Uh, which I'm going to present now. So what uh, we did here is uh, that we collected information on, uh, related to the popularity of these three languages. Um, these are Google Trends data. So basically these are uh, the number of Google searches for uh, various data analysis related, so various data analysis uh, related search terms. And I combine these search terms with the, with the word R, Python and Stata respectively. So here, for example, for a, rather uh, vague search term like data analysis, you see that in terms of popularity, R and Python beats data by a lot. Um, so unfortunately for us, you can only see that Python beats in terms of popularity uh, R, but uh, so this is a situation that every data scientist faces sometime. So I'm just going to disregard this information and uh, look for, a, look for a, a better search term which supports your argument better. So let's randomly select time series analysis and see what happens. Oh, very, very nice. So here you can see that R and Python are side by side in the, uh, in the competition, data coming in third again. 
let's switch back to the presentation. Just a second. And I'm going to exploit this nice uh, web application again, and I'm going to show you the code behind it. This is basically the whole uh, code that does the data analysis and preparation part for us. So you see, we are, uh, or, or if you don't know, I'm telling you that we are using uh, Tidyverse, the aforementioned Tidyverse package uh, collection from R, uh, and this very handy pipe operator, which I, in my opinion, makes the code very readable. So the first seven lines of our code, this is basically the data preparation part. And I think this is where R uh, shines compared to uh, Python, for example. You can see this is almost like an SQLite syntax, like syntax, uh, very readable, no need for comments. It's almost understandable for someone who doesn't even know what Tidyverse is. The next three lines of code, this is all it takes to fit the model and do the forecast you have seen uh, in, the, in the web application. So here I chose a pretty simple model. I, I, I just fit an RIMA model, but I can tell you that if you chose something more fancy, it wouldn't take much more effort uh, using a specific library and running the model and the forecast in a few lines of code. And with the last uh, line of code, I had to cheat a little bit because I wanted to make the plots you have just seen a bit fancy. So mm, I, I had to include a bit more uh, of, uh, of a ggplot code, but then, what I could do is that I could hide it in a nice uh, function. And this leads us to the, our next point, which Mark is going to present. Exactly, so functions, because what is nice about this line is you just have to say that it's the particular plot that you want. You don't have to see any of the details here. And functions class and abstraction is an important part of programming languages that allows you to structure your code into ideas rather than into all the annoying detail having it on the page. And R and Python have functions, classes, packages, and many more, conditionals, ifs, and so on and so forth. You will notice that Stata is not on the slide. So let us look at Stata and its way of uh, uh, abstracting. So running a Stata script. We looked at a replication package by Miklos Koren and Vita Petu. <laughs> we got this. And now here is a video of uh, this script in running. What is it like? Do, yes. Status abstraction is the do file. Stata reuses code by putting everything into a file and then you have to run it over and over. Now there's also something called the program, which is just a Stata do file inside a file, but it's an absolutely horrendous way of extracting things. If you don't believe me, try and do it. By the way, there was none of that in Miklos and Rita's code. They didn't do it for a reason. So you could say, that I is functional and Stata is dysfunctional. <laughs> All right, my mom always tells me that when I mean, I should also be nice and say something nice. So let me show you my favorite Stata code. Ah, oh, you can oh, put wow. some R code into a file and then you can call it from Stata, from the discomfort of your Stata IDE and run it. This is kind of nice. So in conclusion, vote R. If you are old enough to vote, you're mature enough to use R. If you want to look at the code, the app, or the slides, all written and compiled in our studio, you can look at the GitHub and at the Shiny apps. And finally, to close, quiz Joe question, what do R and Python and Stata, what value do they store in the CC variable? Any guesses by what is in the CC variable? It's a trick question. For R and Python, it's the C compiler they sometimes use. For Stata, it's your credit card. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. There will be a 20 second uh, technological break. In the meantime, so please write your questions. You may have already a few questions. Uh, we can ask for most of them or at least some of them. So please and also vote on, on you know, questions that were previously asked. Um, please make fun of the presenters if, if, you, if you'd like to. 
So hi, everybody. Today, me and Arieta are very excited to take part in this debate simply because we want to show you the superiority of language of our choice, uh, which is Python. Of course, the R team already uh, did the biggest share of the help to us showing that Python is the most popular one, but we're still going to continue with this. Uh, we, of course, believe that Python is the undisputed winner of any debate when it comes to data including today's debate, of course. Now, uh, previously, we have seen some polls uh, that were published, that were shown by Gabor. Uh, these were very biased polls, uh, we can say, and they were very untrustworthy. So we decided to bring you uh, what the industry itself is thinking about, it, the unbiased indices. So you can see, for example, on uh, here on the slide, the TOB index, which is technically shows you uh, the popularity of the programming language in the wider tech community by just uh, seeing how many times it hit the search bar. So you can see, you don't have to look that long for the Python to appear on your screen because it's the first one. And you can see that previously it was the first one as well. Uh, you actually see um, an increase in the change, which means every year more and more people are actually using Python. Now, you might be wondering where R is. Uh, we actually did spend that much time to try to figure out where in this whole list R is. And you could see that it's 11th. Uh, it's very taking the most honorable and very far from the top position, 11th spot. And you can see the decrease, the annual decrease, which shows you that less and less people actually in the industry use R. Now, uh, we really don't want to bully this data, but at this point, I'm just going to say it wasn't there. Uh, for the same reason that was already mentioned, just simply because it's not programming language. But a really good question will arise, then what do data people do here? Uh, I can tell you, <laughs> they are actually very busy writing Python code in their GitHub profiles. We actually did a little bit of research. Looks like here, since 11 years ago, probably one of the first people who used Python, we can see very nice programming skills. This is the second team member, actually, for state is still using Python. So probably there's no need to prove you why Python is so efficient that everybody, even when they decide to take a part in the debate, they still choose to uh, defend state for some reason. But uh, let's speak about actual industry. I work, as already mentioned, uh, in a huge company, which is an investment uh, management company, but I work in tech uh, department of it. I'm a data scientist and as part of any data scientist job, my responsibilities include uh, making the end-to-end -end pipeline, which means starting from obtaining the data up until moving it to production, all the solutions. So you might be wondering what's the magic language that we use and a lot of other companies use, and yes, it is Python actually. Uh, nobody there uses R as a matter of fact. And uh, today, Ariada will show you what is possible to do in just under a couple of minutes using Python. Okay, so we have prepared this mini demo, and this is part of what I teach in my uh, in my courses here at CU. So you can you can get the um, GitHub links. In here, we we have made this uh, repository also available online for you to share. So uh, we're going to get um, you're, we're going to do spam classification today. So we're going to get messages and we're going to classify them whether they are ham or spam. So ham, remember, is a good message and spam is um, a spam that arrives in your email box. So in three lines of code, we are importing um, the data, we're reading them, and you can see here that we have only two columns, right? So these are hand-coded data, text, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, ham versus spam. So feature engineering in Python is done relatively easy, one line of code. We are creating a new variable that we are uh, measuring the length of this message. And oh, quick visualization in also one line. And we can see here how long these uh, messages look like, whether they are ham or spam, and the distribution, right? So we can see the unimodal distribution of uh, spam, and they are shorter, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to describe this data, which is also very short code and very concise. And um, the longest message that we can see here is one that is 910 characters long. And it's, uh, we have extracted this message in order to see what it's talking about. And it looks like it is a love message. For me, love should start with attraction. I should feel the need. 
Do you think I am uh, they're talking about Python? I truly believe so. Yeah, me too. That, that was my uh, impression. So in order to do data cleaning, we use functions in Python. And it's again, very, very, very easy if you know the syntax. So the, the, the syntax is straightforward. It's like speaking plain English, almost as simple as data, right? Yes, if you had one. So in order to clean this corpus, we are going to use this function of uh, three lines. And, uh, and you can see here that we remove the, uh, the punctuation, we lowercase the text, and we are done for an, our analysis now. So in order to, to run this and classify whether these messages that we just uh, saw are ham or spam, we're going to use one of the libraries that is the most important library in machine learning in Python, which is scikit-learn. And uh, I don't need to explain you here what goes under the hood, but we're going to use a naive based classifier, which is the best classifier. Remember this when you deal with uh, text data. So the classification report says that we're doing a very good job because everything is above uh, 0 0.8. So you should aim for something like that. So, um, and we're going to look at this confusion matrix here that says that indeed we're uh, doing a very good job because the off diagonal elements are very, very small and this is what you should aim uh, for. So given that we have done this train and test split and we wanna measure how well the algorithm is doing, we're going to test, we're going to do some out of uh, sample predictions, right Guyana? Of course, so why not first test something that is very common and probably we, use, we saw this everywhere. So. Looks like to be or not to be, it will be to be because it is uh, classified as ham. Uh, let's just pretend for half a second that our team has the possibility, even though it doesn't, to win the debate. And in case they win the debate, then they will go to claim their prize. Let's see if our algorithm actually thinks this is a possibility. Looks like it's not because it just classified it as spam. So our team probably won't have the luck. And now finally for the state team, we hate to bully it, but uh, given that state would need a lot of money for its license, uh, maybe somebody would win the lottery and then they can buy finally the state license for however much. Uh, looks like it's not gonna happen either because it needs to uh, be retired at this point. <laughs> there are a lot of different uh, variations that you can use and learn during the classes that Ariadne provides and CU offers, what are different methodologies, but I want to quickly show you the graph here that shows what words are associated with a specific class. For example, very formal, okay, uh, home, calm, whatever, they're all ham. While the words that are more associated with customer, urgent, whatever, these are all spam. These are not the magic words that we use. This is very simplified algorithm that actually shows you. And finally, does the algorithm think that Python works? It does. So choose Python. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot for all the debate team. Now you can hear me okay, right? Because there was some problem before. Um, Okay, so there is a there is a few questions, and and you know you you attacked each other, which which I appreciate a lot, uh, and and I want to come back to to all the you know all the animosity that there is, but before that I want to ask all of you like how you come to work with the the language that you are representing, what was kind of the killer application that made you stick to it, still use it. I understand many of you are using multiple languages, but what was the main reason you are kind of sticking to the language or you're still using the, the language that you are? So maybe I start with the R, R team. So I started coding for real things in 2010, 11, uh, sort of doing a little bit of web dev uh, on the side. You know, this was nothing fancy. I wasn't particularly good at it. Um, I later then doing my PhD, I started doing data analysis. That was, I started with R. Uh, I, didn't, I couldn't stand Stata back then, uh, mostly for the open source reasons. Um, but also, I just, given that I already knew how to program, it just rubbed me the wrong way. Um, and then I tried, I think I tried Python. Pandas back then was really a mess. Uh, like, I, you know, I do think nowadays actually, Okay, but back then it really wasn't that great. And so I evaluated R versus Julia. And uh, in Ju Julia was really nice, but it was 0 0.4, 5. And I immediately hit a bug in one optimization thing. 
I was in touch with the maintainers of that thing. And then I was like, okay, this is a little bit too much even for open source me. Uh, I'm going to use R, um, which worked fine since then, especially once Tidyverse came out. Um, some of the bumps got definitely smoothed out. So, uh, so I think uh, when I actually started coding is when I uh, planned my transition from, a, from an economist to a data scientist. And I was basically, uh, I, I, I was just trying to find like good resources on, on the internet and actually are just popped up. And I immediately found like very good uh, online resources, documentations, courses, whatever I was looking for. So it wasn't like a very conscious choice at that point. But I think what says, says the most is that I'm still using R despite the fact that in the meantime, I learned much more about coding. I, I did data analysis in Python as well. And I'm for some tasks, I'm always going back to R because it's more convenient, easier to use, maybe also because I'm pretty used to it. And that was, that was my first, <laughs> but then um, I'm, I'm still going back to, to R time to time. Um, so why did I start to <clears throat> work with Python? Um, I had um, a very rough exercise, which I was plotting maps, right? Uh, and I, I was dealing with this QGIS or ArcGIS, and I needed this to run for 6,000 rasters or something. I needed to automate that. And um, I, ArcGIS had this module ArcPy, and in order to access ArcPy, I needed to learn to program in Python. So then I fell in love and uh, it's a long lasting love. Uh, actually, the first uh, program, not language, uh, I used was data. Uh, but um, during my studies, du during the same time, I actually learned R2. Um, and then after that, I started to use a bit Python. It wasn't until I started to work uh, that I was using Python all the time. Uh, because I realized how agile and versatile it is. Um, a lot of people would argue that for just the data analysis part, uh, maybe R in some cases might be performing a little bit better, but that's just a myth. And at the end of the day, you're not really doing explorative analysis just for the sake of it. You're usually doing it because there should some other steps follow it. And Python is clearly a winner in every other stage of it uh, because there are some clear disadvantages with R in the later stages. If you ever want to do any machine learning or deep learning, and as a data scientist, that is something you would do on a daily basis. So um, yeah, that's how I started to program in Python. And until now, that's my daily job. Yeah, something else, Chris. Um, because we, <clears throat> when we talked about Pandas, which is this main library in Python in order to do data analysis and visualization, that library comes from the R world and is the most unpythonic uh, thing to date in Python. So <laughs> we should clear things here. The reason it's unpythonic is because Python is not meant for data analysis first and foremost, like R is. And that's why pandas is rocking in Python land and why they're not saying use something else. So why I'm using Stata with, you know, in addition to all these other programming languages that I'm also, I'm also using. And I've used Stata since 1997, which is not exactly 1985, but close. And... Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we are the same age. A lot of, lot of expertise in data analysis, let me put it. So actually I was a, a research assistant yeah, and I was kind of dropped into this project. The project was already ongoing and I had to change a regression. I, of course, I have no idea what I'm doing, but because it's data, it was very easy to, you know, find the regression line in the code and then change, change something and then pick it up as I go, as I go along, which I, which I did. Um, and to be fair, I did uh, think about the different programming languages, the pros and cons of, of, of each. And, and then I realized that I come back to Stata for a reason. And, and that's really what we talked about, the uh, ease of use. And if you want to get something done very quickly, if you're working with data and just fire up your Stata and do like four lines of code to get to a graph, um, we haven't seen anything in the presentations today that can convince you otherwise. Four lines of code. 
Um, I learned Theta during university courses uh, of econometrics already during my bachelor's. And all of my university econometrics courses were using Theta, except for one which, which used MATLAB, which luckily is not present here today. Um, and then I, I still use this data for data analysis and in particular econometrics. And I think for, for data analysis and in particular econometrics, this data is still the killer app. Um, because appreci appreciated that Python has some much wider functionality, uh, um, which I, I, I use I use Python for, for web scraping or even for data cleaning. But when it comes to data analysis and econometrics, and especially with the latest Python and Stata integration, I don't really see a reason not to use econo uh, uh, Stata for econometrics. And... Just let me ask some, some uh, as I mentioned, you can ask questions on, on Slido and you can upload some of the questions. So let me ask the first question, which I actually asked earlier, is this event really gonna be awesome? So I think it is, no? Yes, some more enthusiasm and just look at your phones and more, hopefully. But the second question is, um, which lingo is the biggest plus on your CV? And now, now open the floor, you can, you can, you can, uh, I asked the alumni maybe, then, then which, which one do you think is the biggest plus on your CV? Um, so uh, maybe I'll just briefly say, given that um, currently doing all the data science work, I've also been uh, moving my position. So uh, from one country to another country, and I've been going through a lot of interview processes. So it's something that happened literally like a couple of months ago. And I can confidently say, if it wasn't Python, I wouldn't say it was Python. Confidently say that it is Python, because most of the companies currently uh, are using Python simply because it's so easy then to productionize and a lot of companies using it for productionizing the solutions and given that python is the best way to do it we do everything there so that's why i think python is the biggest plus i have never been quizzed on our state or anything else in any of the interviews i've been only quizzed about python multiple times so i think that it speaks for itself in in finance no in it's a, it's not really finance it's uh, in asset management, however, it's a tech job. So it's a tech department. And I've been uh, also interviewing for fully tech companies and data science startups. So everywhere I had that experience. So Zhuzha, you, you, you also, uh, 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 in addition to C, you also studied in Barcelona and you were, you were looking, and you already had a few jobs. So what, what, what was your experience in kind of CVs and interviews? So to be honest, I think that the, the biggest part is that you have either R or Python there because that shows that you have some experience in programming and it is easy for you to learn new things. Uh, if you have both R and Python, that it's even better because that shows that you've already learned at least two programming languages which can be easily used uh, for data analysis. Um, so I, I still put R there and uh, time to time I meet people who love R just as I do. And then when I mentioned that I'm working for the company I'm working for, which is MRSIS, some of them even know that we are doing cool stuff in R, uh, which is like, I don't know, I wouldn't say cutting edge, but it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, we are using, we're using R for pretty cool things and in a, in a pretty advanced level. And to these two things combined, I think are very convincing. Marty, you wanna? So what was your interview with uh... The econ econ world. Um, <clears throat> so first, going back to the previous question, I think the the honest answer to that is is Python. I mean, which which language has the, the most added value on your CV? But that's because it's wider applicability, and I, I have two points to add here. So one is that we are talking about which language should you start first, if, should you learn first, and. Uh, and I think that still stay there. And the second point is that I work in an industry which is uh, uh, consulting in the field of competition economics, where uh, are both R and Python are very useful to have, but but Stata is the the one that you have to uh, know because because 
legacy is quite important there. And from time to time, we have to review uh, codes written by others or written by competition authorities. And you cannot change the fact that they are still uh, mostly using Stata. And uh, at our company, and as far as I know, at our or all our competitors, the the most important requirement, as you saw in one of uh, in, in a few snapshots in our slide deck, uh, is, so the most important requirement is still uh, Stata in this industry. Any question from the audience? I know you're typing in, but you know if you have a good question here. Yeah. True. But please raise your hand. True, true story. I, I talked, I talked if to you're a student of mine, you have to raise your hand. And there are many students of mine, so at some point you have to. So I, I talked to a lab manager uh, who they employ RAs, and he was saying how they were joking that they should stop getting people who know Python or R because their outside options are much better. They should restrict themselves to state only people because they cannot go and get other jobs. So. With respect to the integration, you still need to know uh, Python in order to get fully integrated in this uh, Stata Python integration. So, yes, of course, but this debate is about the first language. Sure, but just so that. Yeah, there is a question. Hi, I'm your student. Yes, very good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there you go. But uh, apart from that, what is the language that helps you learn the other two the most, the easiest? <laughs> Absolutely. So I mean, the additional information content of saying Python, no, no, no. everything is actually declining. Okay. So let me, let me be a little bit. So the syntax is very simple for a beginner. And it gives you the programming concepts that you need in order to understand how a for loop works, how a function, and then you can transition to R um, because R has a steeper learning curve for beginners. But I, I do think that 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 uh, my Python colleagues will agree. My R uh, colleagues will agree. I know that the, the rest of the Stata team agrees with me. So <laughs> let's let, 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 let's hear it. So can I? And I break character a little bit, but so uh, I think it's important to uh, to be able to to program in something, okay? And uh, so to write good code, and by good code I mean that others will be able to understand it and modify it and and work with it, and uh, and then and then build on that. And and I actually I, I have to agree with Mark that it would be great if it would be easier to do it in Stata. Uh, if you're using Stata, I can help you write good code in Stata because it's possible. It's not super easy, but it's possible. Uh, and it's probably easiest to do it in Python. I would agree with that. Are the Paul Krugman, who is a participant here, uh, he's asking, are the opportunity costs of trying to learn another coding language higher than their marginal gains? In other words, we talked about learning the first language. Is there a point both for a CV and your personal development to learn another? I have kind of somewhat strong views on that, as in I think whatever language you pick first, you should try to get out of the beginner stage. So you should try to get to what you initially might consider to be like really advanced and rock star, but really it's intermediate. Um, but, you know, you use like classes, you use functions, you, uh, you, you do abstraction. You know how to write something that is up to a thousand lines of code, let's say, and it's not overly buggy. And that, that's arbitrary number. I think once you're at that stage, it's very useful to switch languages that are of a different paradigm. So like one of the reasons I like are way better than Python, and this is genuine. I don't think it's objectively better, but why I like it better is the first language that I really learned well, Racket, is functional functional first and r happens to be functional first as well it has classes but really it's you don't need to understand what this is about but it's one of the paradigms python is much more class first really there's a lot you can do functional code but the way that most things are written always rubs me the wrong way especially in web frame frameworks but it's not that it's better it's just that you get a different point of view and so i think once you're really quite good getting another language that is quite different is really really useful and from that perspective even stata 
uh, is really useful because it gives you an interface, which is a clicky, clicky GUI, but those can actually get stuff done for some use cases. And it's really useful to know the workflows that are different where you don't have to turn it into a script and so on, and then run it. Um, so there are two related questions uh, we have, um, which is um, what, uh, what would you, um, your insight on which language would be most used by economic consultants around the globe? And what do you suggest on, you know, for people in social science? Also social science, economic consultants is kind of moving out of the tech. tech. It's a question you can, you can, you can kick the mic and you can, you both can, maybe Marcy can start it. Well, I think I would say this question, I, I don't know what else to add. My experience is that in, in consulting, we still use uh, Stata. And this is one of the fields in the industry where you actually do economics uh, outside academia. So if you love economics um, and want to stay in economics, then definitely do learn Stata. Do learn Python as well, but learn Stata. Social sciences. I, okay, I can, I can take the other half of the question. So I think th this issue of you know what other people are using is super important in 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 any discipline and in social sciences it's really uh, data and this issue has come up so we have literally posed this question a couple of years ago when uh, so actually with Arieda we were working on the course for the data carpentry which is an organization and the community teaching coding skills for scientists and you know what language should we be teaching for economics. Uh, scientists and we decided to go with data because that's what people use and so you want to meet uh, where they are people where they are and make them better at that and now you're out in her as well yes because <laughs> one of the comments was that they like how people pick on Miklos and I think it's only <laughs> fair that now you without the uh, Arieda no, I mean social sciences you know you, you are a social scientist no I would consider both of you social scientists. You want to answer? Okay, so in academia, at least I can speak for the academia uh, part, we care a lot about causal inference. So in order to implement all algorithms that we're using and we're teaching here, you have to do it with data. There is no other way. These routines are implemented and, and, and they are optimized for data. So good luck having that uh, done with both R or uh, impossible to do with Python, most of it. So I do switch between Stata and Python, but a big chunk of my work is actually with text data. So I cannot use data for that. Uh, it's absolutely impossible. So I need to combine both. Uh, and I, I, actually, I'm going to ask, so put Zhuzha on the spot. So when, and then, then there was a question from the audience, and I will go there, but I will put Zhuzha on the spot first. So basically, she is modest, but she was one of the things she had been spending her spare time in the past couple of years is actually translating for, for the data analytics, data analysis textbook. She was translating code from data to R and also partly to, to Python as well. Yeah. What was your experience? There was also a question about comparing codes. What was your experience in kind of this translation of how hard was it for causal inference for prediction? How, yeah. how, how hard was it? So that's what I wanted to say, that it's strongly dependent on what field you are working in. And even in your book, there are like a lot of fields that are, are covered. And uh, yeah, so for, for some methods, for example, for, for panel data specifically, it was pretty hard to find the, the solutions in R and Python. Um, but I mean, in the end, we could, we could do this, <laughs> we could do that. Um, but but it, was, it was difficult. Um, but for, for any, other, any other subjects or any other uh, parts, it, it was relatively easy to, to convert these data codes I mean, originally most of the code was in, in Stata or R, but mostly in Stata and it, it was relatively easy. I wouldn't say it was easy to read Stata code though, because it can get messy pretty quickly and and it's relatively difficult to understand for someone who, who, who doesn't use Stata uh, 
day day by day. Um, so I struggled a bit, but from R to Python, it was it was a is a, is a pretty easy a transition. And also, I, I would disagree with the fact that Stata has the best documentation because because sometimes the fact that you can look into the code, uh, like the actual implementation behind things, it, the only thing that helps. And you can always do that with uh, R and Python if, if you are stuck with what, what is happening in the background exactly. Okay, there is a question from the audience. Hi. Uh, so uh, I know that R is widely used by statisticians, but my question is that uh, why we are using Stata, uh, what's the problem with R is the uh, uh, variety of the packages or the reliability of the packages that has been written in R. So, uh, because I, I heard that R is very good in time series, not Python, but, uh, uh, but uh, so I was, this is my main question. So what's the problem with R? Why, why, why aren't you using R? Is there, is there someone who uses both? Because I'm, um, I have strong. I'm not using R at all, but I want to have an honest and helpful answer to this question. So, so, I, so I can answer it actually. Okay. Um, and then I actually so have a mic. Know, I don't yeah. need a mic. So um, I I use both in, in, in I'm outing myself. So I, I use I, I you know I, I I've grown up with data and 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 now I use more more R. And then I make other people use Python for me when I need it. Um, and um, so the thing is, is R has evolved a lot in terms of social science, not only just uh, prediction, but also in causal inference and and, uh, and, and and panel data in particular. It has basically, I think, now is, is, is maybe the best. It's, I use it for panel data and, and R is, is really good. Um, I think the what's good in Stata is that, but as, as those guys mentioned, you switch it on, you do stuff, you don't have to think about libraries, you don't have to be a techie. And so, so I think that that and that could be an advantage uh, a, a lot of times. But and also, if you look at what are the new econometrics packages, they are typically in R and, and Stata first, and they are often you know developed in in, in tandem. So there is nothing wrong with either. Um, I think the benefit of Stata as that that it's just easier to 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 get started and and in R you can maybe maybe do more but you can also do more damage and I'm not a good so compared to all these people I'm the worst programmer this is why I moderate debate and and if you're not very good um, then it's an advantage that you don't have to think about all the stuff that Mark mentioned you can you can live with that and that that that's a that's a life also worth living. You know, it's, it's it's okay if you live your life without thinking about functions, and that's that's still it's still a good life. Uh, you can think about football and many other things. Yeah. So one thing to add here. So I think I mean the biggest pain you can have with R and also Python, especially if you are not a techie person, is dealing with dependency management and making sure that your the results you are you are showing are can can be replicated. And and for a non techy person, I understand that that can be very even even that you have packages, you have tools for that, both in R and Python. That can be difficult sometimes, and I I experienced it multiple times working with with economists. Um, and and Stata does better in that, obviously. Um, could you address the difference in how these languages transform the way of thinking about data, data manipulation, doing statistics? How the how the languages are transforming the way of thinking about what, what we do? Fantastic question. The, this is actually something where I think why I like the tidyverse and like the genuinely the success of the tidyverse, like pandas is a copy. That's not a lie. It is a copy of the tidyverse approach. Um, ggplot, the plotting library was ported into both Julia, into Python. There's better things when you want to do really nitty gritty things. And so the reason I'm mentioning this is because I think that predominantly Hadley Wickham, but others around him have really thought very hard about what are the workflows, how to design, like he called himself. So he's the, the guy who did many of the packages, not all, there's many others who contributed, uh, of the tidyverse packages. And he thought a lot about how to make many workflows consistent. 
And I think by starting with tidyverse, like you don't have to deal with for loops and a lot of the R programming. In my class, literally none of that is covered because the tidyverse allows you to do it without thinking about many of those programmer things. And I think it's because he's taken a lot of the insight from SQL databases. Uh, and that's why it works for relational databases, but not for a lot of other stuff. And I think the tidyverse really makes you focus on your workflow through the pipe in a way that is quite natural there. And that's very helpful. But you can definitely do that in Python too. Like, like it is really being imported. And there's many data where this is not the right approach. If you do image and so on, you know, you're going to be in Python. There's, <laughs> there's no question for that. So, but I think like R really makes you, there's a very strong, I would say cultural, uh, uh, view of how to do data analysis as well, and it's really geared towards it. But again, those workflows have gone over to other places. And something that you guys didn't mention, I thought you were going to do this if I had been on your team. Our studio is the company that used to be called Our Studio. They are now called Posit because two weeks or three weeks ago, Our Studio is now an R and Python company. So the R flagship company is now R and Python. That tells you also something, right? Yeah. Are, are there other things about how this language transforms the way you think? Or you just say, yes, Python. <laughs> yes, Python. <laughs> um, that, that's absolutely. So I, I also started with data. And I, I do agree that it's very easy to read. And if you know the syntax, right, you, you go slowly, but you, you build up uh, very easily. So learning a real programming language and thinking properly about data structure gives you flexibility and the type of power, I would say, that uh, state per se doesn't give. So I, I would recommend um, learning, if you're using Stata, learning a, another of these coding languages. But, but I, uh, what I want to add is, so we have our Python integration. We have state of Python integration. I don't know who will do Maybe I can add just like two sentences um, about the thinking, like how it changes your thinking process. Uh, I was studying ME in economics here and I mean, it was very much advertised all the state and everybody was using Stata for every class you needed that. Um, then we had a couple of R classes and I wasn't ever particularly feeling myself like the best econ student because my way of thinking was a bit different and it wasn't very statistical. It was more from the data perspective. And I, for example, was sometimes feeling lost working with Stata because I would miss some of the logic, I wouldn't see it written out. So I wouldn't really realize what's the logic behind it. And the same goes for R2. Sometimes the syntax was too, uh, like it is created for statisticians as it was already mentioned. And it was at times confusing to me. And the only reason that Python stood out out of all of those was that it was easy to write your own functions because you simply first thought about it in English, what you want to do to your function and then wrote it out. And it was easy to Google, easy to find a huge community, very supportive one. So I think the way it changes uh, your idea how to work with the data is dependent on how you start and what's your general first idea is about the data structures. If you want something more organized, simple, plain, and something that it can be used afterwards to build on it, I would think Python or R, depending on how your thinking is, is the best. But when it comes to state, if you first learn it, then you're like, okay, now I need to do something bigger. Now maybe I should learn Python or R. Why not do all of it together? So there is one question about applied econometrics in, in, in Python. And in a, this has come up earlier that maybe there is less, but, but I think more and more uh, libraries are developed in, in tandem in, 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 in three different languages. And let me advertise you know, my textbook and my website where you can compare. Uh, you know, applied econometrics in, in, in R, Python, and, 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 and Stata. So uh, we're, we're getting closer to the end. I will, I will try to somehow share. There's a lot of very good questions. I will try to share and, and, and offer some, some, you know, some back and forth on this with the debaters. I'm not sure how, but, but you know, we'll, we'll try to figure this out. Um, if not, nowhere else, then you can, you can see it on, on, on Twitter. Uh, so I want like a final word 
from each of uh, each of the teams. I also opened the vote, so now you can vote. Um, uh, you know where you are, where you are now, and and while you are voting, I you know one sentence, one sentence uh, closing argument, um, and I let Python R and Theta be go the opposite opposite direction. So I let you guys start. Final word, if you want or not, you don't have to. <laughs> Which is Python? <laughs> uh, I think. Just one word would not be enough to describe this, uh, but if you want something reliable and you're think you're not sure about whether you're going to stay in academia or go further in the industry and you really want to succeed and you want to have lots of opportunities, then there is no wrong choice if you do it with Python. I, I opened the second vote so you can vote on you know the original question. You can also vote which team you like the most, which gave the best performance in the debate so you still have so i'll just reiterate one thing that i said before whichever you pick try to get good at it and you know like so so stay with it because so as it good means you do, when the internet goes down you're not helpless because stack overflow didn't get downloaded to your computer that's kind of like when when you know you know when you know how to navigate the documentation so whatever you do uh, try to get to the level where you're like that. Um, I would also say, honestly, like <laughs> it shouldn't be Stata because Stata is less powerful. Like, like it literally will limit you more because it's not a programming language. And if you don't know whether you're going to do data or whether you're interested more in AI and so on, uh, it's those guys probably because that is where all the TensorFlow and Keras and you name it, PyTorch, and I don't know what it is currently. Um, but yeah. Just whatever you do, even if you pick data, just get good at it. Yes. I actually ag agree with Mark in, in that be good at least in a, at least one thing and then maybe multiple later on, but I, I fully agree uh, with that. Also, I agree that each of these tools have their use cases. And I think for data analysis, which is, I remind you, the question of the debate today, Stata is the best. There are other use cases for which the other uh, programming languages are also suitable, uh, image recognition, whatever, text analysis, but tabular data, applied econometrics, data. Let, let me add, you, you guys want to add, add, add something more? One sentence, so I think that you just have to choose your weapon according to the task you have ahead. So you can either go R or Python or you can choose data. <laughs> but I mean, seriously, I think you cannot avoid learning a, a real programming language, which can be either R or Python, so <laughs> go for it. So, so there's actually one more thing I wanna add. So, so regardless of which language you use, I think it's very useful to learn thinking in terms of a pseudocode or a meta code, right? Not, not necessarily the syntax, right? Because one thing that, you know, OpenAI and all those guys will do is simplify learning the syntax, right? So how exactly you do something, you know, what is the exact wording for a loop? What is the exact wording for a plot? You know, tools are gonna help you, but it's really important to be able to think in an abstract way and, 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 and kind of translate your, you know, ideas in, in, into some kind of a code and then either learn it very well if, if the internet goes down or or you know be able to uh, to write a, 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 a pseudocode and then let the that ai help you uh, so just that. to clarify there open ai is already there so this ugly python and r codes we have shown were done by open ai it reads the, the beautiful stata code and turns them into ugly python and r code <laughs> okay so uh let me show you the results of the vote if i if i can So let me show the first vote, which was, so this was the beginning. And I know it should, I actually need to show numbers, but there are hundreds, so this is pretty close to numbers. Now let's see the after. 
I mean, this is very few people voted. Come on, people, what are you doing? You're not, you're not voting? Please vote. People are voting on this. Now vote, please, on, on this. Please vote. This is preliminary result, so no uh, champagne yet. There's still people voting. Please vote. Now there is um, there is excitement. Say that say that team is coming up, and then R is coming very closely. And then and then please people people don't you know wake up on, on, online. Please come and vote. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I mean, they are allowed to vote. So R, R is leading. In the meantime, let me show you another poll that I'm running. I'm oh, sorry, Biden is leading. I'm sorry. I already have. No, but I have this, right? Which was the most convincing team? So I think uh, Team R won one of the prizes. And then, uh, oh, there is Python is catching up. Please vote. Mark, you wanted to say before we close, you wanted to say a few words? You, you wouldn't know if you know Gao and have met him the last year, but he actually published a book. Did you know that? Yeah, seriously, about data analysis, no less. So anyway, uh, Team R, we thought uh, it's uh, it would be really good this year to have the inaugural Rated R Data Analysis Book Award, which this year, surprise, surprise, unanimously goes to Gabo. And, Thank you very much. And, and wait, wait, wait. Like it doesn't come with a prize, but since it's the rated R certificate, it comes with a graphic image of the hottest dates, which is July 17 and 23, 2022 in summer Thank in you Europe. Very much. Thank so, you. There you go. Thank Bravo. you. And, and also anybody, anyone you thought I come to a debate with an actual copy, you don't know me. You know, and then and I miss an opportunity to uh, push it. You know, you don't me no, don't know me well. So I uh, th thanks a lot with this. I would like to um, before I thank everybody, I just just like to say, and and you know, this is how I close all my talks. That it's it's fantastic to uh, to talk about uh, the fight between R, Python, and and Stata, but there is also a war going on very close to us, and we have a lot of friends in Kiev. So if you can help. Uh, Kiev School of Economics is a, is a good friend of ours. We have a lot of uh, connections with them. They're, you know, they're collecting money uh, for donations. So if you have the chance, please uh, give to them. And, um, and with that, I'd like to thank the fantastic teams. I promised you a, a feisty debate and they tore Miklos apart. <laughs> and, and, and which also shows you, you know, which also shows you how you know, how, um, you know, the, the style in the department. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you. I think it was a, it's a fantastic job and, and thanks a lot for the preparation. I talked to many of you about how you over promised, you know, you, 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 you pledged allegiance uh, to me to, to do this uh, job and then you realize how much work it is. So I'd like to thank you a lot for all the preparations and all the work and all the heart that you put into this debate. Uh, thanks a lot.